Hey everyone, I'm Mason Egger and I'm your host of BSD Synergy. This week's episode is entitled PF Sense, a beginner's guide to a sensible firewall. This week we'll be talking about PF Sense. Uh, it's a really cool open source firewall project that I'm a really big fan of. And uh, my trip to Texas Linux Festival this weekend, where I actually gave the exact same talk that I'm about to give today on PF Sense. Today's video will actually contain the live demo of my talk that I didn't get the chance to do at the Texas Linux Fest conference. Um, if you want to see my talk, go to masonegger.com slash talks and download my PFSense talk from there, and you can actually view the slide deck that I have. So I bet a lot of you are wondering, wow, PFSense, I thought we were going to start with something, you know, a little bit more mainstream, like, you know, FreeBSD or OpenBSD. Well, I have multiple reasons for doing what I do. Um, one of the reasons is I didn't have time to do an actual talk this week. Um, I was at the conference all weekend, and then I was busy after that, and I didn't really have time to uh, write out my show notes and plan a full talk. So I had to think to myself, do I want to really wait till the 18th or do I want to do something that I already know that's actually a really good product and do that? And I started thinking about it more and I was like, you know, PFSense really does make a lot of sense. Um, haha. You don't really need any BSD knowledge to use PFSense, none whatsoever, but this will be a good stepping stone for you to kind of like get your toe wet into the BSD world. Another reason is I did do my talk at the Linux Fest this weekend, and I, I met some of the PFSense guys, and I have to say that they are some of the nicest people I've ever met. Um, as I was giving my talk, I was, you know, doing a little bit of the background history of the of the project, and I um, announced that the, the founder is like the founder. Uh, this founded in 2004 by Chris. Uh, his name is Buchler, and I was having a hard time saying his last name. And then from the back, I hear. Somebody say Buchler, and I look, and he actually starts waving, and I was like, oh, and he's actually, that's Chris. Chris is there. He's the founder of the PFSense project. And I was like, oh my gosh, the founder and CEO of the PFSense project is here to watch my talk. Oh my goodness, now I'm really nervous. Um, but it actually turned out great. He was a super good sport. Anytime there were any questions that I could not field, he fielded them for me, which I have to say is a very unique thing. You know, most presenters don't like it when people crash their uh, comp their their talks. I was super thrilled. I was like, oh, thank God. You know, I'm a I'm a hobbyist when it comes to PF Sense, so I don't know all the answers that some of these big people from industry are gonna want to know. But I'm pretty sure the guy who wrote it does. So that was really nice. Um, I guess I will say this coming out straight. I am not in any way sponsored by PFSense. Um, I gave that talk, and I am doing this video under no coercion or anything whatsoever. Um, I just really like their product. I am currently sponsored by nobody, and honestly, I don't think I ever will be. Uh, even though I did make the joke about, you know, I eventually hope to get to tens of subscribers one day, and I have ten subscribers. And trust me, for those uh, ten of you that have decided to jump in this mess, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and you must be insane. That's all I can say uh, to want to watch a YouTube channel weekly about BSD. So after I gave my talk, um, which apparently was really good, I had a lot of people come up to me and tell me that it was the best talk of the conference, that they really, really enjoyed it. Um, after my talk, the PF Sense booth was swamped. They had more people there than they knew what to do with. They were they, Apparently, it was just an absolute field day for them. Um, in which they, you know, it must have been because they were really, really appreciative of me and they, you know, they continually were shaking my hand and telling me what a great job I did and how, you know, grateful they were for that. So much so that the next day they had a present for me. And honestly, you know, I was like, oh, you know, it'd be nice if I got something from I was not expecting anything. I, you know, don't think that I'm like that. I don't give my talks for the hope of getting anything in return. I give my talks because I find good software that the community needs to get behind. So they, they told me they had a present for me, and the first things that were going through my mind were, oh, cool, maybe I got a T-shirt, or, you know, maybe a little itty-bitty uh, PFSense middle board, um, or one of the, the two interface ones. I was like, I would really like that. That'd be great. I also had happened to mention in my talk that in the middle of writing my talk, my PFSense box died. Um, the piece of hardware that I had was nine years old. Actually, it was just about to turn nine. I got it um, right before I started high school, and I had had that box forever. That was a box that was built in the Vista era, so, you know, hardware back then was odd. Um, no, 64-bit, 32-bit, who knows? Uh, and, uh... <laughs> And how much RAM it had. Um, so it died, and I was able to decommission one of my other servers to get PFSense running again because I do use PFSense as my firewall and uh, router at my apartment. 
There's nothing else. My my router, or I'm sorry, my modem is a straight bridge to it, and then that router handles everything. And when it dies, the entire network drops on its ass. And let me tell you, um, being a computer science person, being a software engineer with no internet sucks. So they tell me they have this gift for me, and I'm like, oh man, this is really cool. I wonder what it is. And I open the box, and they're like, well, we'll let you open the box, and it's 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 a box. And I'm like, oh lord, what? I was like, no, they couldn't have. And then they open it, and it's this, this right here. It is actually a PFSense rack server that I'm eventually going to put in my rack. Ha <laughs> ha uh, ha. And it is just amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, they legitimately got me a 6 gigabit Ethernet PFSense rack server. This is actually the 4860 model. Um, they told me they put a... Uh, a, a MSATA 120 gig solid state drive in here. It has an Intel Atom processor for low power consumption. You know, your, your, your routers and your firewalls really don't need, you know, the power of an i7 or a Xeon. You know, that's, that's kind of overkill and you're kind of raising your electric bill for something you're really never going to use. So this is actually a four core Intel Atom uh, that runs at, I think, 2.9 gigahertz, which is, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty great. So a low power processor. Um, if you look at it, it has a serial, uh, there's actually a console port, um, and a, a funny story is I was telling the people that I work with uh, <laughs> that, you know, this is actually, there's actually a serial port in here with a USB adapter built in that goes straight to this um, micro USB, and then you plug it into USB-A and you can serial in. When I was uh, setting up this box, that was the first time I'd ever used a serial port in my life. I have been working at, with the system administrator and as a systems engineer now, you know, roughly about five years um, I'm, I'm relatively young, as you can tell, I had never dealt with a serial port in my life. And I tell that to my, my friends at work and they hate me. They're like, oh, I make you feel old. So if I make you feel old by watching this video, let it be known that I was the first time I got to use a serial port and I actually rather enjoyed it. So, um, it also comes with two USB-A adapters for your keyboard and your mouse, obviously comes with a labeled WAN and LAN uh, port for, you know, just simple that. And then it has four other optional ports, optional ports that you can use for, um, anything. You can use it multi-WAN. This, this box supports multi-WAN, supports multi-LAN, whatever you want. And it's amazing. And, uh, also let it be known that while I'm doing this video, I have no internet. This, uh, this thing in my hands right here, is the backbone of my entire network infrastructure. I deracked it and took it out so I could show it on this video. And I'm going to probably, as soon as I'm done with this first section of the clip, I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to go and re-rack my server and get my network infrastructure back online so I can do the next part of the show. Um, but other than that, you know, it was a great conference. I have to tell you that the PFSense people are some of the nicest people. They gave this to me, no solicitation, nothing whatsoever. Nothing in return. They were just like, man, we thank you for what you did, and here's a really cool toy to play with, and I guarantee you, if any of the PFSense people are watching, I love this thing. It's my new favorite thing in my apartment. I am having so much fun, and thank you for you know giving it to me and for the opportunity. And now a brief overview of what's going to happen in uh, the rest of the video. I'm actually going to do a full live demo of PFSense with you. Um, it's probably going to take a little while, so this video will probably be a little longer, or this may be the average length of the video, depending on how long my demos and tutorials are going to be in the rest of my videos. I do plan, and I'm going to try, to have a demo slash tutorial in every video that I produce. So you can look forward to that. I know that there's one on my list right now where I'm going to discuss the structure of the BSD ports tree where I do not actually do this um, and I or I don't have one planned and we'll see what happens with that. So the rest of the show is basically going to be I'm going to do an install in VirtualBox on my machine because um, it's easier for me to capture the output but I'm going to do a full install from start to finish of PFSense, and we're going to watch that. It actually happens fast enough that you're not going to be bored too much. And then I'm going to use uh, a VM to connect to it, another VM, and it's going to be PCBSD. And uh, we're going to use that to use the web configurator, and I'm going to cover some things, a couple things that I find nifty. Um, I could make a video about every feature in the web configurator, and it would take me probably six, seven, eight hours. So I'm only going to cover a couple of things that are going to catch my eye as I'm making the video. I have no plan going into this, and I'm trying not to make one. We're just going to go with what's my whimsy. If you really want to know what's going on in PFSense, download it and try it out yourself. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. 
Okay everyone, we're about to start the installation of PFSense. From here until the end of the installation, I am not going to be cutting the video or stopping anything. I am going to I want you to actually get a good feel of how long it takes to install this software. Um, the hardware specs that I'm currently running on is I am running my uh, this is running in VirtualBox on my MacBook Pro. It has been given two processors and four gigs of RAM and a 20 gigabyte hard drive. Um, I'm not going to cut. I want you to see. Remember, please remember that this is on a uh, virtual vir virtual machine, so it's not necessarily going to be the best, but it still installs relatively fast. For me, I'm personally really happy with it. So here we go. We're going to start. And by that, I mean I'm going to click on the right screen, and I'm actually going to hit the right button. There we go. So the likelihood is, as this goes on longer, I may continue to make more and more terrible jokes. Um, not terrible as in, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that, but, you know, things that are going to make you want to slap me in the head or something. Um, we'll see if, you know, if it doesn't take that long, I won't be able to make terrible jokes. Uh, yes, I know the virtual machine doesn't support uh, mouse support. I don't know why it always feels the need to tell me this. It's a console for... For Christ's sake, it's not going to support mouse support. Oh, there we go. There's the PFSense logo. It's a really nice logo. And uh, just so you know, this is not the most current release that I am installing. I am actually installing a release that is a little bit older because I actually want to show you the upgrade feature and how easy it is to upgrade the uh, software and the operating system on your PFSense box. So I'm intentionally installing, oh, it's going to go, I missed that. Uh, I'm intentionally installing the older one so that way we can see what an upgrade looks like. Okay, good. It's installing. There we go. Uh, first thing it asks is, you know, do I want to change video format, screen map, key map, any of these? Really don't want to. I'm just going to accept these settings. Going to do a quick and easy install. Basically, I want it to, you know, format the entire disk and take the entire contents of the disk. I really can't imagine a time when you wouldn't want to do that. Holy crap, that's fast. Um, doesn't really make sense to me otherwise. I don't know why you would have part multiple partitions on a firewall and want to have different, maybe, OSs booting or different file systems. Um, if you really want external storage that's attached to your firewall, I would suggest maybe getting a NAS and routing, you know, routing your rules through that, or potentially a secondary drive. But I, I can't think of any reason why I personally would want to have a a secondary storage on my firewall. So now this section usually takes a little while. This is, uh, you know, it's this is generally the largest of the tarballs, um, and it takes a little bit of time to get to. So, we shall see. Do I have any terrible jokes? I hear any good... Oh, no, dang, I don't even have time. See, it knows that I want to tell a joke, and it's like, oh no, Mason's going to start telling jokes, and it zooms along really quickly. It's sad that even my laptop knows me that well. Oh, okay. This one usually takes a little bit of long time, too. Uh, it's usually the tarball, and then it's usually this uh, after installations routines.sh. Um, just so you know, all of this software is open source. You can find it. They do have a Git rep GitHub repository with all of the source code for PFSense. So if you're curious as to what this stuff is doing, feel free to go and do that. Now I actually have to go really quickly, and um, I have to wait just until the time that it says it's rebooting, but not before it actually reboots which is weird to remove the disk and save the settings so whenever it reboots, it does not reboot back into the ISO, um, which is good. I don't want it to reboot back into the ISO because then I look dumb. Uh, well, dumber than I already do. Okay, and it ended install. This is good. So F1 for boot. You actually don't have to hit F1 for boot. Um, and again, I clicked on the wrong screen. I keep clicking on the open broadcaster software, um, but I missed the F1. So it will boot on its own. Um, F1 if you just, you know, you can't really wait that extra three seconds. Um... And now here it is, it's booting into PFSense, and it's, as you see, FreeBSD right there. It's a, this is a FreeBSD trademark. Uh, it's a FreeBSD fork. Really interesting fork, too. I really like it. This is probably, yeah, well, I have to say this is probably one of my favorite forks. My favorite FreeBSD-based softwares, but we'll see. I've heard FreeNAS is something amazing to work with, and um, I actually have a spare machine now that I have the PFSense box, so I might be able to do that. Okay, so it's asking me uh, if I want to do, uh, oh crap, did I hit yes or no? I hit enter. I think it automatically defaults to no. Should I do VLANs? I don't want to do VLANs. 
Uh, so for the WAN, I'm going to choose EM0. For the LAN, I'm going to do nothing because I forgot to add a um, I forgot to add a secondary interface. That's my fault. Do I wish to proceed? Yes. Well, that's good. Now I can show you how you can fix that if you mess that up like I did. So it's starting the web configurator. I think I can change network settings on the fly. I don't think it's something that VirtualBox actually has to be shut down for. I have to turn it off to enable it. So I'm going to have to shut down PFSense and then reboot it, which is fine. It's no big deal. Okay, so as you can see, the WAN did get an IP address, and I'm using the NAT mode on my VirtualBox uh, so that I actually can use this. So right now, it's got the NAT uh, 10.0.2.15. It's a slash 24 network. Uh, kind of weird to use a 10 network as a slash 24, but whatever. I mean, you can do whatever you want. But um, So I actually have to reboot the machine now. Um, actually, basically, I should shut down the entire machine, and I need to enable um, another NIC so I can actually have a LAN. I can't believe I forgot to do that. So I'm going to shut down uh, PFSense, which is power off. I'm going to power off the VM, and it is powered off on my end. It still looks like it's there. Going to go to network adapter. Add another adapter. We're going to do a host-only adapter, and we're going to put it on VBox Net One because that's where my the uh, the source that I have to use to access the web configurator. That's where it's at. Now let's see if I when I start it. Oh, good. When it started, it actually opened Broadcaster Software. Caught it again. That's nice. I really like that. So I had, I just only did that for those of you. I just had to do the uh, I had to add another NIC so I could do the LAN. And here we get to go again. Yeah, see, it, it boots relatively quickly. You know, if you have a power outage or something, it is going to, it will recover relatively quickly. Yes, I know, no mouse. <sighs> File system is marked clean, no core dumps found, that's good. And starting the web configurator, that's nice. It's doing all of that. While I'm waiting on that, I'm going to... Well, no, I don't want to mess with it right now. I've got the scene set up for open broadcaster software. Okay, cool. So now it detects our LAN. It actually de detects the LAN. Um, and I want to assign interfaces. Should we have VLANs? No, I don't want one. Uh, EM0 for our WAN and EM1 for our LAN. Nothing, and then we do an yes. I guess it detected it, but I don't think it knew that that's what I wanted to use it for. Maybe it guessed. That's why it didn't get an IP address. Usually it does get an IP address and sets up DHCP client on it. So we'll see what happens here whenever, whenever it gets back. It should come back up with an IP address. It didn't. Now what? Okay, let's see what this does. Factory defaults. Don't know what that means. Okay, we're booting. There we go. Should get an IP address this time. There we go. So 
Um, my assumption is, you know, this is this is the first for me. I actually made this mistake in the video, and I'm not going to redo the video to, you know, hide my mistake. I'm not going to redo the video to hide how PFSense handles it. I feel like that would be unfair to you, and that's unfair to the community. So this is my guess as to what happens, and I'll probably investigate in the source code later and figure it out. Um, whenever I first rebooted, it knew that there was a LAN there, and it wanted to assign the interface, but the DHCP server was not set to run on that on that interface. And then when I assigned it as the interface, um, it set the DHCP server, but it did not, for some reason, did not start it. Um, so I did a reset to factory defaults, which really we haven't changed anything. That's really a good way. Uh, they have the same thing in the configurator too. It basically it flushes the rule set, any of the main changes you did, but it keeps the basic configuration there. So I did that, and then we suddenly get an IP address. DHCP is work working on here now. This is actually the, the IP address of the DHCP server. So that's my guess as to what happened. Uh, I do not know. And if any PFSense people are watching this video and would like to comment below as to where I made my mistake and you know maybe what, what it actually did, hey, feel free. We always look forward to it. Um, that being said, if you're just smart and you remember to add the virtual interfaces properly the first time, or you know, you know, you have hardware, so most of the time you're not running this in a virtual appliance, so they will be detected automatically. You won't make that dumb mistake. Um, I have had to change out interfaces before on another box of mine because I kept having I had a really bad nick that would you know decide for some reason Sundays right before Game of Thrones started it was like oh I don't want to work today and it kills itself and I'm scrambling like oh my gosh if I don't see what's going to happen I'm going to you know I'm going to red wedding this whole dang thing and uh, so I had it was switching it around and usually whenever I was swapping the NICs around it usually uh automatically found the DHCP server. So maybe this was something that because it, there was no LAN and there was no DHCP set up at the very beginning of the installation, that's what the problem was. But most of you that are going to have physical hardware, you're not going to have this problem. And know that if you add a NIC and change it later, you still don't have this problem. Um, I have a wonderful way of being able to expose the weirdest bugs. So I don't really think that's a bug, but you know, it could be brought to the attention. Maybe, hey, if you forget to add one and add it later, yeah, fix it. So the this is the, uh, the, the shell. Um, obviously it's really nice, but there's not really much power to the shell because the cool thing about PFSense is the majority of this power exists inside the web configurator. So, um, you know, we have things like being able to assign the interfaces, which you saw me do, uh, set the interface IP address. If you have static IPs and you want to do that, uh, reset the web configurator password. If for some reason you lock yourself out, um, reset to factory defaults, rebooting the system, halting the system, ping host, shell, PF top, filter logs, resetting the configurator, PFSense developer shell. Um, I don't know what the difference between that and the shell is. I, that'll be interesting. I might have to figure that out later. Um, update from console. That's pretty nifty. Uh, we're actually not going to do that. We're going to do the update from, uh, from, the web from the web configurator because I like how it does it. Enabling SSH. You know, this will enable SSHD on uh, your outside network. Um, don't do that <laughs> unless you know what you're doing and you install like, uh, you know, Felta ban or something because people will hit it and you don't want people attacking your, uh, attacking your PFSense box. Uh, restore from a recent configuration. Those are pretty nifty. And then restart PHP FPM, you know, that has to do with the web configurator. So now we're going to switch over to, um, another virtual machine that I can use. That's going to be on this network that I can use to configure the grand conf or the web configurator. Okay, and now we're going to test running the web configurator. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now that the response time on my VM is a little bit slow between running my open broadcaster software to capture and encode all this video and uh, running my virtual machines and all of that. I'm really pushing it on the edge of my machine. Uh, really need to build a new desktop coming up soon, but I'll have to save up for that later. So... Hopefully the slowness of the machine doesn't stop us too much, but you'll get the general gist. I want you to know that the slowness of what's going on is really not uh, anything to do with PFSense. It's more to do with the fact that my machine is really running out of resources. So uh, here we go. Go to Firefox, and uh, I have this still up from the last time when I was doing uh, doing my presentation at... Um, there we go. I didn't have NumLock on. Do my presentation text Linux Fest. And we go to this. And uh, one of the cool things about PFSense is that it actually uses a self-signed cert to use HTTPS. So you have an HTTPS loginable, uh, you know, web UI, which is pretty nice. I'm going to go ahead and add the exception and confirm it. And here we go. We have PFSense. And then pass uh, username is AdWord. Password is PFSense. 
um, for the first time you log in, you're going to be prompted to change this in here. The first time you log in to uh, this, uh, the web configurator, you're going to be asked to uh, go through this setup wizard. And this setup wizard is going to guide you through some basic steps for uh, your PFSense box. Okay, so this first thing talks about PFSense Gold. Uh, PFSense Gold is a subscription-based uh, service that you get with PFSense, and you can get a lot of really nifty things out of it. Um, some of the things you can get are it's uh, you can get the access to the living uh, web book. You can get access to hangouts with developers and monthly uh, videos about the state of PFSense. You can get um, automatic backup configurations, uh, so you can actually uh, automatically back backup your configurations to an offsite server, and it will back them up back for you. And a lot of other really nifty things, and it only costs uh, ninety nine dollars a year. Um, I purchased PFSense Gold because I wanted to support the community, but also because I wanted access to the book. And after gaining access to the book, I actually learned quite a lot about PFSense, and I have to say that it really is worth it. The PFSense documentation on their website is pretty nice, but it really has, doesn't, you know, doesn't even compare to the PFSense book. And I really recommend getting it and, you know, supporting the community. It's good to support these open source communities. Okay, this where is where we enter our host name. I'm going to call it PFSense. For the domain, I'm going to call it BSD Synergy, you know, the name of my channel. Uh, primary DNS server, um, I'm used to using your typical uh, Google servers. Uh, I made the joke at um, Texas Linux Fest that I don't allow for my cable provider or my to use their own, uh, you know, sneak in their own DNS servers on my box because I only want Google to know everything about my life. So... Uh, let you choose a time server. Any NTP server here will work. Uh, for time zone, uh, America slash Chicago. I'm in the central time zone. There we go. Okay, and then the configuration of the WAN interface. The selected type is uh, DHCP, but we have our MAC address, MTU, MSS, all these things. If you uh, really need to like spoof your ISPs, you know they only want to give out... Uh, IPs to the MAC address of the of the modem. Well, you can spoof it here with this real easily. Uh, static configuration if you need to set up a static uh, thing real quick. Um, PPPoE. All these configurations, honestly, I I've never really used them and don't know much of what, about what they do. Um, and as you can see, you can hear. I think you can hear my keyboard clicking as I click it, and then you see it. So that all that latency is being caused by the fact that I'm running too many applications, and I really need a more powerful system. Um, I only think that it's really giving me this problem because I'm using uh, graphics. This is a 1080p resolution monitor doing the VM, and with that, and then trying to record it and all that, it just it doesn't like it. Um, the LAN address changes to whatever you want. Your subnet mask uh, uses the CIDR uh, subnet mask references, so that's really nice. Click next. Uh, admin password. We're, uh, you know, you can choose this to be whatever you want. I'm going to do BSD Synergy again. And for those of you that are curious about if they can, you can use that to get any of my stuff. No, I never use that as a password. I have really long, complex passwords. But for the sake of a demo, I don't want to use it. So it doesn't seem like it has any password policies. Um, which I bet you could probably change. The, the great thing about this thing is everything is configurable. Um, but if not, you can always just use Pam. If you must. So we're going to reload the configuration. And the reload is happening. It's basically the reload of the config. Just gets everything set up. That quick little th steps. And goes and does this. And now it says, okay, we're done. And now we either can, you know, to click here to purchase services offers by the PFSense team. Uh, they offer support and all that. Or we can just click here to go to the PFSense configurator. Which we're going to do. And here we go. And as you can see over here, right where my mouse is, oh, you can't see my mouse on OBS. Well, that's nifty. Um, if I highlight it, is it? Yeah, it does. Okay, right there. Uh, it was obtaining your release, uh, your version information, and now I click this, and I'm going to upgrade my, my system. This is how easy it is to upgrade this system, is I click update, and it's going to retrieve it. Oh, look, I have an update. I click confirm. And now it's going to go to my fan the fancy PFSense repos and download all of the stuff and update the the, uh, the machine. Hopefully this isn't going to be too uh, slow because of the um, virtual machine, but it does not look like it's actually taking any time. However, the machine will have to reboot after an update, so I am going to uh, lose a little bit of time. I'm actually going to cut the reboot out um, 
of the video. So as soon as it gets done and it goes into the reboot, there's gonna there's gonna be a hard cut, and then I'm gonna come back in talking about the configurator. So, but we're gonna we're gonna I'm not gonna shut it off until it's done configurating. I want to show you configurating. Is that a what? Yeah. It is definitely not a word. Um, after it's done configuring the everything and doing the update, fetching all the packages and all that. And actually, if you looked, uh, I was at 2.3.1, and we're going to 2.3.1 underscore 5. So I'm actually quite a few packages. I'm like, like five minor version releases out. Not really version releases, more like bug fixes when they get down to that, that level. But I am, you know, I'm not necessarily really close or really close to it. I'm not as far away as it could be. I'd love to see if somebody was to try to do an update, to update on an older one, especially one that's not 2.3. Because the interesting thing about 2.3 is this entire web UI that you're seeing uh, changed. They completely redid it. Um, if you go to their uh, the PFSense documentation page, the PFSense wiki, that format is the same format of the old PFSense. They completely redid the UI in, um, in Bootstrap and they and now it's actually it's even mobile friendly. So that's one of the things I really like about it is I can be sitting on my couch, uh, like oh I want to change a firewall rule or something. Usually this happens for my gaming systems because um, as Microsoft would have deemed it or you know whoever in the gaming industry deemed it the strict NAT, um, which really it's not even really a thing. Um, that I, you know, I, I don't allow inbound connections to connect to my console, so we can, you know, a lot of gaming systems use the whole uh, hosting and all that. So I, like, oh, I can't, my Wii U can't connect, I can't, you know, I can't play Splatoon. So I go to my phone, I'm like, oh, well, here, look, phone, I go, and I change it, and, you know, there you go, I've got a... I've got firewall rules that I was able to edit from my phone really easily because the uh, interface for my firewall is... And is mobile friendly thanks to Twitter's Bootstrap, uh, you know that free and open source software. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, that's a pretty good thing. Not really much of a web developer, even though I do it on the side. But I have to say, if I do, uh, if I do participate in web development, I definitely always end up using uh, Twitter Bootstrap. So it's actually going to. I ended up talking through the whole thing, so I'm just going to let it keep going. Um, in three, two, one. Let's see if it actually was able to reboot. Not yet. It's not quite yet ready. Um, so let's go over to this. It's not open. I thought I had that open still from my, uh, my open broadcast software from when I was doing uh, the PFSense thing, but I guess I don't have it open. Okay. And it's back. So, you know, about a minute, minute and a half after a patch. That's not bad. Not, not really not bad. Uh, oop, didn't click in the right spot. So if I click over here, admin and BSD synergy. No, I don't want you to remember the password, Firefox. Go away. And now we're here. And we have 2.3.1 up here in the uh, system information under version. Uh, and it's based off the FreeBSD 10.3 release. Um, as you can see, I have 4 gigs of RAM down here. The CPU usage is at 100%. Um, that is not because of anything that PFSense is doing. Oh, and there it goes down. That is probably because my computer is absolutely, you know, just crapping on itself right now. I'm surprised it hasn't melted, um, and it's very angry with me. So uh, hopefully, hopefully nothing bad happens. So uh, we can go back through the general setup, which the general setup uh, was what we basically covered in uh, the wizard. But we actually can do some other things now. We can, you know, specify. Uh, where we want this DNS server to actually, you know, host. Um, we can DNS over, server override. We can allow them from, you know, our ISP. Disable the DNS forwarder. Um, so that way, you know, you will be used as the first DNS server, blah, 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 forwarder. All that so we can disable our forwarder. Time zone, time servers, language, web configurator. The theme, the PFSense theme, I actually have not played with these, but I feel like if I do that, it's going to anger it, so I'm not going to. I'll play with those on my uh, on my real one that has all the CPU usage to spare, and if I find them interesting, I'll definitely make a comment in my own. I'll link it in the description and make a comment. Uh, dashboard columns, I can actually, on the dashboard, there was the one, two, and three columns. I can easily do that and add some other things. Add some widgets, log filter, uh, manage logs, monitor scripts, all these things, and this was just in one menu. So now, if I go over here, um, some of the interesting cert things about it is uh, I can set this up as a certificate manager. It can be its own CA. I can set up PFSense as a CA. 
It's amazing. Nobody else does this that I know of. Maybe there's some other projects, but I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Um, some of the advanced settings are pretty nifty. Um, I say that, and I may have may or may not have ever used any of them. Anti lockout. Make sure you can't, uh, you know, accidentally um, lock yourself out of your out of your system. Uh, that's nifty. Um, you can disable it, so you're like, I don't want it. Uh, D DN DNS rebind check. This one actually I had to use when I was setting up my Plex server because Plex wants to be able to uh, query inside, do a DNS query on the on my internal network, and the rebind was stopping that. So I had to disable DNS rebind checks on mine. Alternate host names. I actually had to put some alternate host names in here for my Plex server um, to make it work. I'll probably do a blog post on my. Uh, on my page about what I needed to do to get Plex working behind PFSense. I read a lot of articles about it and a lot of them didn't work. And I spent like four or five hours and I finally got it working. So I'll probably write a blog post, hopefully within the week, maybe by next week, uh, explaining how to set up Plex with behind a PFSense box. Um, this is where you can enable sure secure shell. Um, and you can even disable secure shell login for, uh, by default, excuse me, and only allow keys. That's great. Uh, serial terminal, uh, the serial speed. That this is a different. Um, this one is one that I actually had to Google because I was trying to use 9600, and it's actually 11520 to or uh, uh, actually no, I'm sorry, uh, 115200. Uh, primary console. I can choose the serial console. There's actually a VGA console. My PFS box doesn't have a VGA, so I wish it did. That's the only thing I wish it had was a VGA. Mostly because, and believe it or not, you know, and I'll tell you right now, I'm 23. I've been working with a system administrator in some way, shape, or form as his assistant or stuff. I did this in college. I've been working uh, in this field for about five years now. So I started when I was, oh, I can't even do math, 18, around that time. And I had never used a serial console until I had gotten my PFSense box. It's just not a thing. So if you want to feel old, I'm sorry that I made you feel old, but I not only had never used a serial console, I really didn't even know how it worked. So... Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, look, you can even password protect the console menu. That's nice. So, uh, another interesting thing about PFSense is that it is, by all, you know, you know, by all shapes and means, it is FreeBSD. It is a package on top of FreeBSD, a special uh, package. So, you actually have a package manager. You can use the PKG package manager. So, if I go to available packages... Um, was unable to retrieve, and now it's checking. Let's see if it can actually grab that. It usually grabs a list of packages. There we go. Uh, and it's got a package manager, and you can search for packages. You can check. I can install anything, anything I want, because I have a package manager. Isn't that cool? Like how many of your how many of your firewalls you know that have a package manager? Now, of course, if you do install something with your package manager that does bring in all the security implications of the package that you brought and it's probably unwise for you to do so but hey it's your box do what you want to do with it um so we can always go back into the setup wizard update user manager is pretty nifty i haven't done this because i really have no use for it but as you can see there are users there's groups there's settings there's authentication servers um i can do ldap i can do radius i can set up unix groups or ldap groups to manage my uh thing i can give you know only certain people can view uh the dashboard but some people can go in and change firewall rules but can't do this anything that you can typically do you can assign and you can create users and groups for it. it's like a typical linux system i'm sorry unix system oh my goodness it's like a typical unix system it's amazing um, so the interfaces, we have our WAN and we have our LAN. These are basic, uh, these are basic, these are basic interface options that, you know, I can enable or disable the interface, MAC address, MTU, speed and duplex, uh, some of the advanced configurations. I can do uh, protocol timeouts, back off and back off, cut off. I can all, I can edit everything. I have so much power. This, um, the, the PFSense gives you the power to do everything. Anything and everything you want to do, you can do. So now your firewall rules, you have NAT, alias, rules, you have your schedules. You uh, PFSense does support traffic shaping. This is, uh, if you're using this at home, this is kind of similar to your quality of service where you can like, okay, I don't want too many P2P connections hogging on my bandwidth. I want to be able to reserve this much for videos, this much for modern browsing, this much for torrents and stuff like that. 
Um, so your traffic shaper can do that. We have our rules. So I want to be able to create a firewall rule. And no rules are currently defined for this interface. You know, we literally just did a, uh, you know, did it. So let's add a new rule. And I'm going to open up, uh, try to open up port 80. So what are we going to do with, with this? We're going to either pass, block, or reject. Um, pass lets it through. Block. Uh, blocks it and then read blocks, you know, blocks it and then actually, I believe if I remember correctly, block um, blocks it and tells somebody that they blocked it and reject will actually just let it time out. It just kind of sits there and, you know, so that's, that's nifty. Um, the, that's actually something f natively from PF and I don't know much about the PF that's behind PF since because it's the free BSD's version of PF. That was a fork. I know a lot of open BSD PF. Um, but not so much of that. So they changed the name terminology in OpenBSD, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. There's block and drop. So, you know, I, the, or, so I'm guessing drop and reject are probably the same thing. Reject probably is what they, they just changed the syntax to drop. So it drops it. Um, I can disable the rule by default or not by default. I'm sorry. I can disable the rule, uh, interface. I can choose for it. I'm going to want it to be on my WAN, uh, address, family, TCP, uh, source. I can, you know, I can open up a source, single host or alias network for any of these, for the LT2P clients, WAN net, all that. Uh, so basically, where is it coming from? Where is it going? Uh, I can log it. I can actually tell to log any packets that hit this rule. Uh, that's pretty nifty. And there's some advanced options which allow uh, source OS. So uh, we can find the source OS. And wow, I've never actually clicked on this. Boy, do they have a lot. What they, you can source OS back to BST 3.1. Oh my goodness. Wow. Like what? Wow. Okay. That's, that's fantastic. There is so much you can do here with this. I'm going to let y'all handle, deal with that. Uh, if you want to play with it on your own, because this is definitely some nifty stuff. So some of the other nifty things that PFSense has is there are, is a captive portal, which uh, if, you, if you don't know what that is, that's uh, you go to a hotel and you want to get on the Wi-Fi and you open their free Wi-Fi and it's like, oh, you have to have this username and password and pay pay me $65 for you know a two meg pipe down because it's awful internet there. And we've also painted your rooms with special kind of paint that blocks your cell signal so you can't use your own hotspots. Yeah, so uh, that's what a captive portal is and you can actually set one up in PFSense. You have a DHCP relay, DHCP server, uh, for both IPv4 and IPv6, uh, forwarder and a resolver, uh, you can only have one of those on at, at a time, dynamic DNS, so if you want to host your server farm at home, that's probably something I'm going to set up soon, um, IGP, IGMP proxy, load balancer, NTP, PPPoE server, SNMP, uh, UPnP, and NAT PMP for, uh, for gaming, for you know, universal plug and play and allow some of the gaming stuff through, wake on LAN, um, the VPN, uh, it supports OpenVPN, and then it also supports LT2P uh, VPN. Or it's actually really it's a, it's a tunnel. It's a layer two tunneling pro uh, process. So it, it's a tunnel, and there's actually no encryption over it. So they include the IPsec underneath it because if you're going to be using LT2P, L2TP, sorry, um, you're going to want to be using IPsec for uh, for securing it. Otherwise, you're going to have a completely unencrypted uh, tunnel. Um, Status, this is a really nifty one. You can get status on anything. So let's check some DHCP leases and see what we've got. Yep, PCBSD is sitting right here. It is online active. This is its start date. And if I want to convert it to a, uh, that's actually, this is a wake on land mapping and this is a static mapping. So I can easily add those. Um, so those are the DHCP leases. Uh, interfaces, let's see what's under interfaces. Just so you know, a lot of the stuff I'm clicking on, I'm just clicking on. I may or may not have ever actually seen this page before. There is so much in here and that I find new pages all the time. Uh, you know, I can actually release my DHCP address from my configurator. Uh, load balancer, IPsec, monitoring. Let's see what the monitoring one has. This should be showing me network traffic. I believe. Yep, there we go. Actually, this is just, these are just processes, uh, you know, what's going on in my system. Uh, probably not going to be much going on, uh, mostly due to the fact that it's one, there's one machine attached, and other than that, it's pretty, nothing else going on. Uh, open VPN, package logs, queues, services, system logs. Let's look at our system logs. That's a pretty nifty one. Yeah, and here are the here are the logs for 
everything I want to see. Let's see what my firewall is doing. Probably not much. It's a real, relatively closed network. Huh, who's on? That's actually, uh, I used a host-only adapter for my wake, for my, uh, my virtual LAN. And this is actually the, 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 this is what is attempting to be my, uh, my laptop. This is my laptop. It, it doesn't have, the, this is the IP address range for it, but that's my laptop trying to talk. DHCP logs. Uh, here's your DHCP logs. But basically you have all your logs and you can filter your log by things. And you know, man, you know, manage them and all that. It's it's really nifty. Uh, I think the only other thing that I want to check on the status page is let's go look at the traffic graph. Probably going to be pretty boring. There's nobody else on this network besides my my little uh, VM here and the PFSense because it's all a virtual network. Oh, and there's also you know my MacBook which is connected to it. So yeah, there's nothing happening. In one kilobit, yeah, nothing's happening here, so there's nothing, nothing interesting. Usually, this is pretty nice, and it's got some stuff going all over it. But right now, there's nothing going on, and you know that's really nothing wrong with that. Um, over here, we've got these are the, some of the other diagnostic tools we have. The backup and restore. This is the feature. Oh my goodness, this feature is amazing. So let me tell you the story of what happened with this one. I can back up all. Like, I just completely do this, and I click download, and I will have backed up and got my entire configuration for anything that I've changed on the system, including the password, and it's encrypted. Um, and you can even encrypt the file if you want. And then I download it, and then I put it in here, and I click, I hit browse, select it, restore, boom, it's got it. It even will handle if you moved machines. Um, what I did is I had a config from my old PFSense box before I got the rack server from uh, from the PFSense guys at Texas Linux Fest, and it, it noticed that, hey, these aren't the same NICs. There's some different NICs. Which ones do you want to be when? Which ones do you want to be LAN? Inside the configurator before I rebooted. And then I rebooted, and it came up, and it worked. And I was I, that was amazing. That was the greatest thing. So the backup and restore feature, man, is it nice. You actually have a command prompt from the terminal. Wow. Uh, I have config execute. And there's my IF config for that. I have a command prompt that I can run from my web configurator. Um, some other nifty things. Factory defaults, halt the system, packet capture. This can natively capture packets and support it as a PCAP. And then you export it and you can open it with Wireshark. It's just your typical PCAP. It's a TCP dump. That's so cool. You can diagnose network issues without actually having to get on the box and like installing Wireshark. It's already there. Uh, states, trace route. This was the one that I found really interesting. I loved trace route. So we're actually going to do my personal website because I've done Google before and then you get nothing fun. So we're going to go ahead and use Traceroute. And as those of you that know that you use Traceroute, Traceroute takes a little bit of time to come back to us. So we're just going to sit here and wait on it. Should go out. I believe it worked uh, the last time I did this test, but we'll see what happens. And there we go. We have our Traceroute. And that is the Traceroute all the way to my server. Uh, and then you can, you know... There's that, and then there's PFSense Gold. And I, you know, I, I did not get to uh, cover everything. Let me stress that, that I did really and truly didn't get to cover everything I wanted to cover. Um, I, I decided I'm trying to do this so I don't make the video too long. I could sit here for hours and we could go through every option and set up everything, but you don't want to see that. Kind of takes away some of the fun for you, so that's fine. Um, I hope you enjoyed the PFSense video. I hope that it's helpful. Um, it's honestly probably one of my favorite open source tools. It's one of the most powerful open source tools that I know that's on the market. And I really hope that after this video, you decide to go out and you decide to check it out. Um, again, I am not sponsored by PFSense. I am in no way affiliated with them. They gave me a present after I did a talk for them, or not really for them. I did a talk for the community about their product. Um, they hadn't, you know, they really didn't even know I was going to be there until the schedule was published. So, you know, that being said, 
I'm, you know, this is, you can take what I'm saying as honest. This is one of my favorite products. I hope you. Okay, so to wrap things up, you saw me, uh, you know, install it and you saw we went through all the configuration. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video this week. Uh, a couple of extra pointers that I wanted to add from what I, you know, who I got to see at Texas Linux Fest. I had really good conversations with the, uh, the Minnow Board people and I hope that you'll check them out. Um, with the GitLab people, I really, really love GitLab. Um, I feel like their design for dealing with internal projects is probably one of the the better designs you know unlike you know your git your uh, bitbucket and github they actually have three types of repositories which is um public private and then internal you know the internal repository is only for people that or can actually log in, so you could create it as like a company thing. If your company wants to have some public repositories that people can access, but then you want stuff that only the people that can log in and internally can view, then you have that option, and I really like that option. Um, I guess the other the other people that I really enjoyed getting to see was uh, the FreeBSD booth at um, at Texas Linux Festival. Actually, they sent some of their A players. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to talk to the other booths, so I really don't know if they sent major people in their projects to the Texas Linux Festival. But FreeBSD sent Drew Levine and Chris Moore. Um, Drew Levine is a wonderful woman who is on. Uh, actually on the board of FreeBSD. And I was like, when I, read, when I read that article, I was like, whoa, they, you know, they sent somebody who's on the board. This is incredible. And then there's Chris Moore, who's, uh, who's one of the hosts of the podcast that actually inspired me to create this video series, um, BSD Now. And he's also uh, on the core team for... Um, for PCBSD and for FreeBSD. He's the founder of PCBSD and on the core team for FreeBSD. And I was like, wow, they really sent some hard hitters. And I actually got, uh, it's back right here behind me. One second. We got a t-shirt at uh, Texas Linux Festival. And I typically like the t-shirts. Um, this is the logo. A little penguin with, you know, Texas hat. You know, howdy, y'all. It's a good shirt. I like the design. My only critique is who the hell wears baby blue in public? Really? Like baby blue? Um, but the cool thing is, is I actually did get Chris <laughs> to sign the shirt. Um, he probably thought, and me and my friend did this, and he probably thought we were crazy, but, you know, his shows, the show has really, you know, helped gain, you know, helped me with my knowledge and everything that I want to do and kind of is you know, giving me direction for what I want to do with open source communities. So I really appreciate that. And I felt like, you know, Hey, let's get his, get his autograph. I probably won't wear the shirt, but now at least I know, Hey, that's the time I met Chris Moore. The first time I met Chris Moore and I got to get him to sign the shirt. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show this week. Um, if you like the, if you liked it, uh, click the subscribe button below, leave me a comment with some suggestions for things you want to see, uh, still have a relatively large list of topics that I'm going to go through. Um, and I hope you keep tuning back into those. Um, most of the other topics I can tell you right now have some really corny titles. Uh, the PF sense one was, you know, kind of clever, but they get corny and they get terrible. So if you like the channel, you know, subscribe to me, hopefully come back next week, watch my videos. Uh, if you like the video, like the video, if you have any comments for me or anything, leave them in the comments below and, uh, I will see you next week and I hope you really enjoy playing with your new PF sense router.